Hi there, and welcome back to another edition of Scale Up Radio, the podcast inspired by the entrepreneurial scale up system and designed to make navigating our scale up journeys that little bit easier by learning from others' experiences. I'm Kevin Brent, and today we've got a real treat for you. We're thrilled to have Avinav Nigam, who is the founder of Turn Group, and he shares his remarkable journey, and it really is remarkable, from the rural landscapes of Japan to pioneering ventures across the globe. And Avi enlightens us with his real passion for solving complex problems, the importance of culture in scaling businesses, and his unique approach to leadership and team management. And we discover Avi's insights on identifying market opportunities, how he goes about thinking about the strategic options, his criteria for evaluating new business ideas, and how he's making a significant impact with Turn Group by providing ethical migration services. You're going to want to make sure you don't miss this and any future episodes by subscribing to Scale Up Radio wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. You can also nominate a guest for Scale Up Radio if you know someone with an interesting Scale Up story and you can find out how in the show notes. So for now, join us for an episode filled with invaluable lessons on innovation, culture and the art of scaling businesses effectively from someone who's done it multiple times. So let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Scallop Radio. I'm delighted today to be joined by Avin Avnigam, who is the founder and CEO of Turn Group. So, Avi, welcome to Scallop Radio. Amazing. Thank you for having me, Kevin. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, really, really excited to, to talk a bit more about uh, what, uh, you know, scaling up businesses. Uh, it's one of my passions. Brilliant. Yeah. And, and I'm going to get into it in a minute. We know you've got, a, you've got a really strong back history in all sorts of aspects of global scaling. So really keen to, keen to tease that out. In terms of the turn group, what's, what's that all about? As I was, uh, uh, I, I have another business in uh, sort of the real estate investment space, which is also a technology company, uh, sort of, uh, you know, pre- uh, present across a few different markets, Germany, Spain, and UK. Um, as well as uh, sort of a technology base in India. Um, I was uh, moving on, if you will, from that business and on an operating capacity, uh, continue to be you know, involved in advisory capacity. But uh, one of the things I had uh, uh, in you know, early last year was, uh, was sort of a, uh, uh, what, what you might call a midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess the question in front of me was, uh, what am I really doing with my life? And am I really working on topics that are meaningful, they can actually have a big social impact, um, uh, not just a financial uh, sort of outcome. Uh, and through that journey, I, um, I ended up meeting a lot of people um, uh, across uh, you know, different parts of the world, Dubai, Berlin, sort of Amsterdam, London, um, India, in fact, as well, um, who were sort of caught between this um, issue of um, their intellectual capital being of a certain order of being sort of very advanced uh, in some ways, but the actual um, work uh, that they were contributing to the to the economy to the workforce not being of the same uh, same order. So uh, I, I met doctors in Berlin, a doctor in Berlin who was a taxi driver uh, for free now, and you know of course a very good yeah. profession, but just yeah. very different from what they had done. A dentist working in the restaurant. Uh, I met this um, this very very smart lawyer um, working in, the, in 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 the reception. Uh, at, at the reception uh, in a in a in a you know private residence um, in in Dubai um, in London I met this incredible uh, artist uh, from Iran who, um, who whose pieces are in the National Museum um, and they're working as a cleaner um, uh, so it just wow. it, it it all yeah. sort of felt extremely uh, odd as to why there was such a dislocation yeah. between yeah. the intellectual capital and sort of the workforce requirements so um, and it, it, it still felt external it, it didn't really you know directly affect me personally. So, you know, you don't drop everything in your life and, and start another company, even though my wife believes that's sort of what I, what I do all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, what is it today? Abby? is that, is it like that? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's sort of like that. Right. And, um, and, 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 uh, but you know, we, we have a nanny in, 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 in London, we, you know, takes care of the kids I have two girls, six and two. Um, and I know it's a long winded way of explaining what the company does, but it, I think the, the human side of this is a big reason why I started it. So I thought I'll, I'll touch upon it a little bit. So she, um, apparently wanted to wanted to work at the NHS. Uh, she has uh, she's an operating theater nurse um, in India. She comes from a very sort of strong background. She comes from a strong nursing college as well. Um, and because 
uh, she sort of got uh, in touch with an agent to help her migrate uh, to the UK. Um, she was scammed out of thirty-eight thousand uh, no. pounds, which was wow. her entire, not just her life savings, but her family property had to be sold in order for this uh, person uh, to be able to move to the UK. Um, and the moment they landed, um, they realized that uh, the job was uh, was fake. It did not exist. Right. Um, imagine the terror, the panic of you know moving to a new country mm-hmm. and being offered a role that looks amazing on paper and everything's there. And the moment you land, you realize it doesn't exist. It's it's all it's all fake. Mm-hmm. Um, so that you know, I just, just the more I went into it, the murkier it became. The more sort of problematic it became as to how the abuse of the visa system, but also the predatory nature of a lot of these uh, these these uh, and I can only call them scam artists um, in the sector exists um, and how they're sort of taking advantage uh, of these uh, you know very sort of uh, well-meaning and sort of hardworking talents with very high intellectual capital and you know, the ability to contribute um, just because of a lack of information and and transparency. So uh, that sort of was the genesis of the new business turn group and and turn is sort of named after. Uh, this this migratory bird, the Arctic yep. tern, right, which uh, flies the maximum distance every year, sixty five thousand okay. kilometers. Yeah. Uh, it's a story of, of of taking flight. It's a story of sort of a borderless world. It's a story of uh, individual struggle for future generations, uh, because that's sort of what's happening here, right? Um, is many many of the cases we are finding that people are sort of their entire lives are being uprooted and and sort of destroyed um, just because of uh, financial. Um, you know, short-term financial uh, uh, gains by by these by these con artists. So that's what we we set out to solve. Amazing. And and when did you set it up? Uh, so we've been active for under just under a year now. Um, so it's a it's a relatively young company. Um, we're uh, we have um, we've actually grown exponentially. Uh, we're now uh, roughly fifty people strong. Uh, probably going to be around um, three hundred uh, by 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 the end of the year. Um, we are present across the UK. Um, so London is our headquarters. We're in uh, Munich, uh, in, in Germany, we're in Dubai, um, and we're also in uh, New Delhi and Bangalore in India as well. Um, and we sort of have found uh, such a strong sort of, um, if you will, product market fit is one of the key words that I keep talking about um, for our model, um, uh, just because of the macro gap, right? We have this huge gap in the skilled labor workforce, yeah. especially in categories like healthcare, uh, which I also have been personally impacted by, or my 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 friend um, who um, uh, is, is, is sort of uh, uh, has been impacted by the the um, the. I had a friend who passed away um, in in the UK. Um, she was an incredibly smart um, thirty two year old lawyer. Um, who you know to you know had cancer, sort of stage three leukemia, uh, went through this you know very excellent treatment at uh, at uh, at this uh, very famous trust, um, but unfortunately uh, after five months um, while they were cancer free, they were told to sort of go home because there were not enough doctors or beds. Um, people were on strike, uh, and I've seen this direct fallout of some of the news that we see on in the media. Um, and this person uh, who I was, you know, was texting with her literally every other day um, to see how she's, and, you know, they had to go home because of not enough sort of staff available. And um, yeah, within a month, uh, they picked up a lung infection and passed away. So I know that there is a huge dearth and need for, um, uh, you know, these these healthcare talents, especially with nurses and doctors and uh, AHPs and so on. And there is an abundance of talent trying to, um, you know, at least for these highly skilled professions trying to come in, um, but they don't find their way. So that's sort of where we've been able to create a good footprint now in sort of three different markets um, in, uh, in in supporting uh, the ethical and legal um, and fair migration uh, of talents. So, and how does the how does the business model work, and and how have you managed to scale so quickly uh, in in such a short period of time? So the business model is very simple. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's basically what it's trying to do is it's trying to remove all the middlemen from the process. Um, so essentially, the way that any sort of recruitment happens in white collar world, if you will, for the technology sector or financial world, um, you just have one person that is interacting with both the talent and the client. Um, we believe that we don't need seven steps for, let's say, a healthcare person. Um, to find their eventual employer, let's say in an NHS trust. Um, okay. And today we have 
you know, we have trainers, we have people who are also, you know, lawyers, we have recruiters on both sides, we have introducers, we have relocation people, it's completely, completely crazy. Um, so what we've done is we've collapsed that entire into a two-sided platform with both the, the talent side being able to register um, uh, fairly quickly through AI that all the data sort of gets captured, you know, through WhatsApp integrations, they're able to upload the documents and everything sort of in place. And then they go through a rigorous five-step process. Yeah. Uh, and then once they're ready, then their candidacy or their sort of uh, uh, talent gets exposed, their profile gets exposed uh, towards uh, the recruiters. Um, and it's not just exposure, but what happens is we're actually matching through AI again, um, the, the the profile to the specific roles with a certain percentage of accuracy. And that allows the recruiter or the employer or the trust on the one side to, with confidence, um, uh, you know, be able to interview them immediately. And then the entire process, um, that's when the elves go to work, the entire process of, <laughs> <laughs> of compliance and verification and immigration and relocation, including pastoral support after they land for six months, is all sort of taken care of through verified uh, suppliers. So that's sort of how the platform works. And that's sort of been a big part of our growth journey has been the amount of technology we use in enabling uh, and facilitating what is a very archaic old world process, very manual process, um, and made it like, a, you know, 10x faster and, and much more cheaper, to be honest. Okay. And and who's who's paying? Is it the recruiters that are paying? In the traditional yeah. traditional way. Sorry, you, you did ask the business model. Yes. Um, so the, the <laughs> so we, we operate on a very ethical sort of basis. Uh, one of the key challenges in the category is that we I just gave an example, and there's several such examples of uh, candidates shelling out tens of thousands of pounds um, because of lack of information um, and being preyed upon. Um, we do not trust the candidate. Um, we only help them with a certain amount of training and preparation um, from an interview perspective or a language perspective, accent perspective as well. We found that to be quite important, um, as well as some amount of career counseling for the individual and their families, because that's a big part of the decision. So that is one thing that we do get involved in, but that's sort of a short-term crash course. Um, we basically charge the employer, so whether it's the NHS trust or the private hospital or the care home uh, for um, the, the recruitment fees, the placement fees, which is a very, again, very standard uh, cost. We tend to be 40% cheaper than what they typically pay because we've been able to remove so many layers in that transaction. Um, then we also support with the relocation and um, uh, migration and sort of compliance services, additional services. We can we charge a little bit of money for that. Um, and then the pastoral support for six months as well. We're also currently helping the NHS uh, several trusts, for example, to find accommodation uh, for um, these, um, uh, you know, batches of nurses or uh, care workers that are trying to come over um, because that tends to be one of the biggest headaches um, for people. And that's why a lot of them actually leave or are unable to complete um, their qualification exam once they arrive. So we're able to help with that as well. Okay. So, and, and often with these two-sided marketplace kind of kind of model, like like I think I've understood here, the challenge is to be able to grow both sides at the same time. You know, if you, if, I, if I'm a candidate, um, I, why would I register with you if you haven't got the jobs? And equally, if I'm yes. a if I'm a recruiter, why yes. would I register if you haven't got the candidate? So, how do you how, yes. how in a short period of time? And I, you know, your website says that you've got a million plus candidates, yes. and and you've got ten thousand verified recruiters. Yeah. So, how do, how did you yeah. build both sides of the model so quickly? Yeah, uh, so we're, we're currently tracking at 1.2 million, uh, which is um, actually a majority of this healthcare. There's a little bit in IT, a little bit in hospitality. We've been able to accelerate the supply side um, quite rapidly. We actually are uh, one of the only uh, framework partners of the government of India. The government of India is actually has a mandate uh, from uh, directly from the prime minister himself uh, to facilitate the ethical and legal um, sort of migration of um, it's around 3.5 million talents in the next uh, next five years. So it's it's a very very high uh, ask, and they are focusing mainly on healthcare. It's called they call it, they call it Heal by India. Uh, so the government integration with their databases has also been something that we've uh, gotten through 
uh, in the first few months of our business. Um, we also uh, partner with the largest sort of medical association, so the IMA Indian Medical Association, as an example, uh, or the teachers, uh, sorry, the Nursing Association of India, uh, TNAI, as an example, or AHPI, which is the health practitioners. So we're integrating with a lot of these databases in order to yeah. present credibly as the platform of choice uh, to a lot. Of, and of course, a lot of digital marketing, direct channels, referrals, and so on. So around 45 such channels that we activated first to start to get um, people uh, interested in what we're able to achieve. In the beginning, it was not about placements. In the beginning, we started offering this um, preparation program, as I mentioned, for jobs that they were anyway applying to. And we saw the success rates going from, you know, them being presented to a role and maybe getting selected 20% of the time uh, to around 85% acceptance rate. So that sort of gave us confidence that these people are getting value. And then we sort of extended that uh, to, once we locked in the demand, we started to also offer that up as a as a uh, uh, as the full full package, if you will, uh, to the supply side. But completely right on the the, the issue around the two sided be- marketplaces. Always, um, you know, one side you know goes ahead and the other side has to catch up. Uh, we faced that problem in the first few months, but I think the one big takeaway for me was be very clear where is a sh- where is the scarcity. Right. We realized that demand was not scarce. We realized that the scarcity was supply. So we had to go very, very deep in owning the supply because the one who owns supply in this category where supply is short everywhere is the one that will control that category long term. And where is the supply going to come from for, let's say, healthcare workers in the next 20 years? Yes, Philippines. Yes, Africa. Yes, South America. But India is dis- you know, very distinctively placed to be able to contribute uh, to the global economy and the healthcare systems globally by nature of the amount of nurses and doctors and EHPs that are getting produced there. Um, so that was one of the big reasons is for us to was really get the control over supply and we've sort of gone deep uh, to make sure that happens. On the demand side, once we had that in place, we were really naturally able to go to the demand and say, look, this is what we have. You know, if I'm a trust, would you work with a government accredited partner or would you work with any random sort of uh, uh, agency? Uh, We then got onto what is called the NHS framework, uh, which allows a supplier to provide um, direct services such as talent placements uh, into, you know, the 215 NHS trusts Um, as well. We work very closely with NHS England. We work very closely with the NHS trust. Um, We also have an exclusive partnership with the, uh, or a you know, very strong partnership with the Association of Physicians um, of the NHS as well. And all of these partnerships have actually enabled. So the one key takeaway for me was really figure out what will allow your model to scale to a level and come uh, from a very, very credible point of view in a category where there is the lack of credibility or lack of trust, yep. that is what we were solving for, which is why the channels using government, large partners, NHS framework, government framework, and so on, allowed us to uh, almost leapfrog a few steps um, to be able to get um, a much higher level of a buy-in uh, from uh, the, the demand side as well. So there was a little bit of that uh, that really played a part uh, in moving us uh, a little bit faster than we had expected. Very good. And the, some of some of your services in there are a bit more people-based, and but of course the core of it is the is the AI. Uh, a platform yeah. that you that you built. I imagine that's a fairly expensive thing to to have built. So how did, how did, how was that funded at the beginning? Yes, yes. Um, so we, we we do have um, uh, we are um, we are venture backed. Um, okay. So we do have some of the some of the best sort of uh, um, uh, not not in the beginning, right? But um, as they saw some of the things coming together, uh, they, they they did decide to um, invest. Uh, we 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 do have uh, um, uh, luckily that as one of our uh, you know, financing channels. Um, the uh, and, you know, happy to touch upon that maybe as well. Uh, but the the AI side of this, uh, just to give you a snapshot, like AI is a buzzword that sort of you know everybody's throwing everywhere. Yep. Um, what has been very clear for us is that there were only this, there are certain parts of this process um, and the actual global recruitment um, that you can do in a small scale as an agency and you can do, you know, hundred people, whatever a year, 500 people a year, you know, thousand people a year, if you're very, very good, but how do you actually help uh, a million people Mm -hmm. migrate across the planet? Right. And in in order to seek um, their global careers and sort of contribute to the economies uh, that they're participating in, um, it would be impossible without 
technology actually being the one that's the driving force um, as opposed to being, you know, there for looking good on a deck, right? So what we ended up doing is uh, AI as an example. If you're a nurse, uh, Kevin, you're a nurse in uh, Kochi in Kerala, south of India, okay? okay? You've done a four-year degree. You want to work in the UK and the NHS. Um, you've received uh, now your English language result on the ILTS, which is a good answer. You got a 7.5, which is fantastic. Very well done. Thank now you. you find this ad. Yes. Now you find this ad online, you know, to find your for next role. You click on the ad. It then takes you to a pop-up which says, okay, um, a platform which says, okay, can you upload your CV? Now, immediately, this is where, and as an example, where the global recruitment breaks because one million database that we have has one million different kinds of CVs. Yeah. Right? Everybody is unique and they express it in the in the in the most horrible way possible for recruitment, which is a different CV format, right? So a different CV format, beautiful, but also not. Um, you upload that CV. Immediately, what happens is we then the system is basically breaking that CV down into eighteen different parts, right? And that creates a profile within our system in the candidate platform. Then that profile also gets rewritten, right? automatically, depending on the, where the person comes from and their English level and so on, it gets rewritten with grammatical updates. Any information that is missing, let's say from 2016 to 2018, Kevin, it was not clear, right? When you were working in the Kerala hospital, wh uh, what your exact experience was. So mm -hmm. you are pinged on WhatsApp, right? You reply to the uh, WhatsApp message, uh, the, the bot. That then automatically updates your profile, again, rewritten, right? In a standardized way. Uh, uh, into uh, the section of 2016, 2018. Then you are messaged, okay, what would be your preferred interview slots? Then you choose the interview slots in advance because you know how your job currently is from nine to five or you know you probably do evening shifts more or whatever. That gets updated. It then asks you for your degree certificate, asks you for information around you know your, your reference letters. You upload that to the WhatsApp and it automatically sort of updates the platform. Now, the beauty in all of this is not one human has so far picked up the phone or interacted with this individual. Mm -hmm. In a typical recruitment agency, as soon as the CV comes in, the phone gets picked up yeah. and people are talking. So that has allowed us to almost not remove, but uh, uh, sort of delay the action on 95% of the supply, right? You focus on the 5% that is ready or you help them get ready, right? Then the second step is also, right, as an AI, is the we have all the 230, uh, sorry, 23,000 jobs that are live in the NHS at any given point in time, we are aware of them, they're in our system. We're able to immediately match the top 10 profiles for every job using AI. We're able to predict the accuracy of them uh, to be a fit for that role or not. Right? The second example of how we're leveraging AI to drive a lot of our process and success rates. Um, so and we do have you know, uh, PhD scientists, we do have people that have sort of done this at companies like Amazon, like both sound systems sort of uh, grab the Uber version in, in, in Southeast Asia, uh, people that have done this in Deliveroo, right? So we have some of these people that know how to build very mm -hmm. smart sort of AI systems. Um, but at the same time, I think it's in the application as opposed to just developing a technology in the lab. Um, and that's what I'm most sort of uh, proud of. So we've done, we've done, I think we're still, I keep calling ourselves 1% there. We're 1% there. Um, but in terms of what I believe um, uh, uh, practically, I think it's already really starting to bear fruit for us uh, on the AI side. Very good. So this isn't your first Rodeo, you've got quite a quite an extensive uh, career background. Do you want to just run us through what 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 got you to the point of a year ago of starting starting turn? Of course, of course. Um, let me let me. Uh, um, I, I I roughly have two phases. My, I'm Indian, uh, so I graduated from this this uh, this 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 nerdy college uh, called IIT in Bombay, um, and I started my career in rural Japan. Uh, it sounds completely completely right. bonkers. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I was working with, uh, I got a job with Procter & Gamble, PNG, which is, you know, as you know, one of the largest consumer goods companies. Um, and they sent me to rural Japan to set up a production plant uh, or facility. Um, and there were 300 Japanese people and one Indian dude. Um, so naturally that went well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that was so, straight, out of, straight, out of, straight out of the college. Straight out of uni. Yeah, straight out of college. Yeah. Straight out of university. And um, wow. highly recommended, uh, uh, not 
not. Um, so that, <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, it really put me in the deep end. It really con- pushed me into understanding a completely different culture, picked up the language, can read, speak, type Japanese. Um, I really, really understood how people operate and think and you know, the psychology of, of migrants, and which is what this company is sort of uh, based on. I really ingrained that, right? And, and, and to me, that was a big sort of... Sh- shaping point for me as, as, as an individual. Anyway, spent um, roughly less than 10 years at Procter & Gamble initially in Japan and then sort of running their Asia business out of Singapore for uh, the detergent brand, Ariel, um, and, and fabric softener brand as well. Uh, so both sort of billion dollar businesses. Yeah. Um, I then quit abruptly, and this was the first time my wife was quite upset with me, uh, to move back, um, one of many, uh, <laughs> 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 move back to India to, um, uh, to in fact, set up uh, the first um, uh, first ever plant-based uh, meats company um, right. in 2012 um, before um people even knew what the word vegan was in Asia. Uh, so this is way ahead of its time. Um, uh, and we were doing sort of lab grown meats and it was, it was insane. The kind of stuff we were doing it was very, very cool, uh, but also very, very early. Um, so one of the key learnings, again, as I mentioned earlier, is product market fit, timing the market, really knowing what you're building, um, whether the timing is, uh, you also don't want to come in too late uh, because you sort of, you know, you're, there's going to be a hundred players, but you also don't want to come in too early. And then you're sort of waiting out for 15 years and nothing really moves. Um, I mean, you can, and I, I believe, I just believe my willpower is not as strong as some other people might have. Um, and, and, and we didn't, uh, we didn't really succeed in that one. It's also one that taught me the most about building companies, to be very honest with you. Okay. Um, I then built another company um, in the auto space, um, uh, which, uh, uh, it's you know you, we would we were buying uh, uh, used cars directly from customers through technology. We were fixing those assets and sort of selling them on uh, to car dealers. Uh, so C to B to B model. Um, there is a company like that in the in, in the UK now as well. Uh, it's called Motorway. Um, uh, yep. So similar model of yep. uh, you know taking control over the supply. Um, that business uh, you know grew exponentially. We went from um, literally f- five ten of us. Uh, you know, starting out uh, in a in a in a gas station, a petrol pump, uh, requesting people to let us assess their cars uh, to what it is today, where uh, we do a billion dollars in revenues uh, with ten thousand employees uh, across um, Asia, Middle East, Australia, and Southeast uh, Southeast Asia as well. Um, That's huge. Yeah. The biggest learning for me there was really understanding. Um, uh, number one was the consumer psychology of it, because going from a company telling you to buy things from you to shifting the behavior or psychology to saying the company saying, why don't you sell this to me? It's a very different uh, consumer okay. messaging. Yeah. So that was the one sort of interesting learning I had. The second big learning I had, I had never seen hyper growth like this in my life. It was just mm. as we were, we were making it up as we went along, to be very honest. A lot of the, a lot of the learnings have been um, very first principles, right? Um, a lot of the stuff I'd learned at PNG, I sort of had to forget, if, if you will, to rebuild this from scratch. Right. Um, I think being extremely focused on the big picture, um, what where we're trying to go, but at the same time solving the problem of today um, and moving on fast uh, is so so important. Um, you you just simply don't have time to get stuck because if you're stuck, you're essentially you're you're, you're losing. I often t- like to tell people, look, startups and technology companies have to operate at 100x pace compared to a corporate because otherwise there's no way to catch up to their size, right? So yeah. you naturally have to operate at that at that pace. So that was one of the second companies that I um, was for for also. Uh, post that I was with Disney Plus. Uh, I think you 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 probably picked that up uh, as well yeah. in the profile. I was vice president of Disney, uh, sort of building out uh, the platform in the early days. Um, uh, again, working on a, on the consumer side and the supply side, uh, which was very very interesting. I saw the journey up to 100 million users uh, over there as well. Then we sort of moved back to the UK. Um, so sorry, my daughter's here. Uh, she would like to say hi. Hello. You want to say hi? <laughs> She's going to be shy. <laughs> sorry about that. So um, then we moved back to the UK. So we've sort of grown up. Uh, I've lived here in the 90s. My parents were here. And then we sort of, you know, sort of grown up between India and UK. Uh, my wife grew up between Germany and, and, and India as well. So hello. Want to say hi? <laughs> You're going to be shy. <laughs> so... Um, Moved back to the UK, so I started my my previous company uh, before Turn, um, uh, which was very similar to the cars business, uh, and also actually quite similar to what I'm doing at Turn, 
Uh, it was also a C2B model where we were buying directly from customer or owner. It was in the real estate space. Um, so what we were doing is we were um, allowing consumers uh, to um, get a frictionless hassle-free transaction to sell their properties at the, the, you know, the fair price, at a good price in a guaranteed, guaranteed guaranteed way without sort of getting into all the chain selling and gazundering and gazumping that happens everywhere you go, um, being able to give a, a, a fixed price and, and move, move quickly. And at the same time, we were then converting those assets uh, into uh, sort of long-term livable homes uh, at like um, below market rents in order to provide affordable housing um, across um, the markets that we were operating in the UK, uh, in Germany and in Spain. Yeah. Um, uh, that company is called Imo. It was uh, quite an interesting model because we also allowed uh, more, um, if you will, long-term, uh, low-risk investors to participate um, in the investments uh, because they were not looking for short-term gains and you know the highest price possible in the next uh, three months and then just turning around the asset again and again and again. Um, these were people that are looking for like 15, 20 year uh, investment horizon. So that allowed us to sort of, uh, you know, do the right thing for the customer. Uh, we would use technology to sort of make the entire renting experience uh, completely um, actually 21st century, right? So property management sort of issues with rent, uh, you know, any any sort of uh, updates to their to their billing or um, you know, their utilities, everything would be managed through the app. So it's, it's literally the future of, of living. Uh, you could customize the furniture in your property depending on how you wanted it. And you could just go into the app and, you know, attach a 65 inch TV if you wanted. So all of those changes we were able to do uh, through the through the platform. So anyway, long story short, that um, company continues to do quite well. I, uh, I built it for seven, six, seven years now and uh, um, uh, then sort of handed over the reins to, uh, to the team that's running it today uh, much more effectively than me. And uh, I've sort of moved on uh, continue in advisory capacity, but moved on to 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 build uh, build turn as we talked about. Amazing! So a quite a diverse range of businesses there. It, you know, we've got we've gone from kind of detergents to the 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 non non meat meat, the cars, the properties, the the Disney Disney Plus. I mean, it's what what ties them all together? Is it that yeah. supply and demand aspect of it that that that, that you seem to love, or what, what is it that ties them all together? I've uh, often thought about this. Uh, <laughs> it's like, what, what, what um, look, my, my view on this is as follows. I, I think um, I've always been drawn to the most complex of problem statements. Um, I'm most drawn to things that people tell me is impossible. So when somebody says it's impossible, I will definitely find a way or try to find a way. Yeah. Um, when I see a market opportunity, uh, which uh, I just cannot stop thinking about and obsessing about, um, you will see me uh, maybe building a company in that space. So I think that's the one sort of the psychological side of it, if you will. The second side of it, as you correctly pointed out, I, I am, uh, you know, I understand three things really well. Um, I understand marketplaces, right? So how do you connect a consumer uh, to a business uh, opportunity or, 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 or a business uh, sort of uh, client, right? How do you connect these two? So C to B, as I call it, it's a very unique way of building a company because not many, not many founders or entrepreneurs are actually well versed in this kind of model. Yes. Uh, so that's something I'm, I'm interested in. I'm also not shy of whether it was at 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 PNG, whether it was in the cars business, whether it was real estate, whether it's now. I'm not shy of um, asset heavy, operational heavy businesses. Um, supply chain businesses, um, because I really see hyper efficiency to be such a big unlock like Amazon does, like Uber does, like, uh, you know, any of these places uh, where there's a lot more delivery, if we will, and a lot more operational involvement. I get drawn to it. Um, so those are sort of the couple of other um, uh, aspects. And lastly, I, I genuinely think um, if there is a future that, uh, that, 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 you know, I am, I can personally feel the pain for, um, and I, I want it to be better, um, I would like to build that company, right? So whether, again, whether it was cars, whether it was uh, Disney+, Plus, whether it was um, real estate tech, whether it is uh, turned with human capital, um, I'm really, really, really drawn to, um, you know, finding, um, you know, a, a much more beautiful, hopefully better version right. of, uh, of the present. And, and, and that's what I get really excited so that, about as well. So it's that challenge. So, so is is that what keeps you moving on want to you know you kind of get to the point where you feel you know what i've i've kind of kind of solved the big part of that challenge so i need something a bit more exciting is that is that is that what's driving you on um 
I think so far, yes, that has been true. Um, I think in my previous companies, the problem solving uh, appetite, if you will, um, was one of the biggest draws, uh, the, the complexity of it, the, the intellectual sort of power required to sort of address it. And, you know, the, 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 the seeing sort of the, the company coming to life, the, the fulfillment from that, of course, was very, uh, was very, you know, was very, very good. I think what's different this time. Uh, and, and, and I, like, I feel it in my bones. Like it's just, there's so much purpose in this company. There is so much sort of direct human, um, improvement uh, possible, like on a very, very, very um, fundamental level. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's horror stories around migration and God, some of it I can't even share on this, on this, on this podcast, but I, I just feel this is one thing. And my entire family has sort of been in the social impact and sort of charity space forever. Right? They've sort of built uh, multiple um, sort of uh, enterprises in healthcare and education and, you know, on, on a very grassroots level, agriculture. And I've always felt like the black sheep, like capitalistic black sheep of the family. Um, and I think this time I, I actually feel like um, I've just found hopefully that beautiful blend between um, being able to build a very big sort of business that can, um, as I said, support human migration across the planet in an ethical way. And at the same time, do it, uh, such that um, it actually helps, um, you know, millions of people. So that that for me is 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 uh, I've not I've not had this specific feeling before, um, and, and that's why I, I feel this is probably a much more uh, longer term one. So this is probably going to be my, <laughs> right. if you will, uh, so, my retirement really, plan. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So in five years' time, we won't be hearing about the next the next one, and your wife will be happy. She'll be uh, yes, yeah, not coming home with us. Slightly happier. Decided. So <laughs> so over all of those years, then. Let's see. You know what are, you you pulled out a couple of things already, but strategically, what do you what do you look for? You know, how do you how do you know whether um, this is this is from a strategic point of view going to going to fly and you're going to get that product market fit? How do you, what sort of things do you look for? Such a good question. Um, I think step number one. I think it always is rooted in a very real problem. Okay. So there is this concept of, um, I, I like to talk about it like a, a SISP, uh, so solution in search of a problem. Okay. Now, this is one of the biggest mistakes or fallacies that, uh, that uh, you know, found this. And, you know, I, I was exactly that in my first company, right? I thought I had this brilliant idea. I could, uh, I could change the world by, by, by making uh, meat from plants and everybody's going to lap it up. Um, but that was a solution at that point, but nobody had a problem. Nobody actually, you know, people didn't actually care. The world did, but people didn't, right? So um, I've seen that to be one of the biggest sort of reasons why companies fail is um, not solving for the right problem or not solving for a large enough problem, first of all, and then not solving for the wrong problem. Um, so that, that is what I call, you know, solution in search of a problem. Do not do that, right? That's a yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. um, the second thing is then what you do is you take that to a macro level, Right, so you've you've now zoomed out ten thousand feet. You look at it from a ten thousand feet level and say, look, okay, on a macro level, is there a an imbalance, a large enough imbalance out there? So, as an example, UK um, is short roughly half a million healthcare workers. If you include Germany, that number shoots up, and include care sector, it shoots up to two million people short in just these right. two countries. Wow. Globally, you're talking about a ten million worker shortage in healthcare. Right. Um, where is the opportunity? Then you have a market like India, 1.4 billion people that's producing 30 million young people entering the workforce every year with 5 million new jobs being created. So naturally that does not going to work for too long. So there is, and there's a you know doubling of medical colleges in the last 10 years. So there's, there's a very clear sort of macro picture that you'll start to draw. Right? Yeah. That's the second thing. So make sure you validate it at a very sort of um, 10,000 feet level. The third thing, is really asking yourself the question, why hasn't it been done before? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Right? Because everybody's like, this sounds so obvious. You know, Amazon, like, this sounds so obvious. Why didn't Uber, this sounds so obvious. Why didn't it? But there are going to be, you will find so many reasons why people will tell you it doesn't work. You need to, you, you cannot dismiss those prob questions, right? You cannot dismiss those concerns. Those are legitimate concerns. You need to understand those concerns and you need to have a way you believe 
which we call go-to-market, an execution route that actually solves for those questions or concerns. So if you cannot come up with that, you may not have all the answers, and that's okay. But at least you need to have a, 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 a almost a 70, 80% confidence that there is a path to execute this differently from how it's been done uh, in the past. So those are the three sort of broad uh, areas. And the last thing I believe um, in, in, in what we do, in what I do in building, te- building technology companies um, is to really find what I call the right to win with tech, right? So unless you have a right to win, um, which means uh, you could be, I don't know, um, uh, you you want to become the most efficient uh, person at, uh, uh, I don't know, being, being, a, being a tree doctor. Sorry, I'm, I'm picking up something completely random. Um, and there could be an efficiency gain you can get with technology, but is that really going to change how tree doctoring has been happening forever because it's a very manual process and you still have to kind of get to a certain shape. And sorry, I'm, I'm giving a very random example. My point there is figure out what that right to win is with technology. What are the problems that you thought of in step number three can, can be solved um, and is really technology the, the, the way to do it? Um, so those are sort of the four broad uh, topics that I like to, uh, at least I, I, my, my framework tends to, yeah, tends I to think be about. That's, I think it's a really good framework. So a really, really strong need, some kind of imbalance that eventually, essentially there can be a bit of arbitrage, maybe, maybe going on moving one thing to, to the other understanding why it's not been done before um and um yeah how can you how can you make a a, a right to win how can you exploit that um yeah. genuine in a way very yeah very very clear very clear framework love it thank so, you so what about what about from a you know you've scaled really fast and and in in turn you've grown to 50 people in just a just a just a year so what about the people side what have you what lessons have you learned or would you would you, would you impart around around people for people yeah. So I think businesses, um, a lot of us get this wrong. Uh, I've gotten this wrong as well. Um, I genuinely think that the one thing that stays true over the years for the business tends to be uh, the culture. Um, and I know culture tends to be this wishy-washy thing on the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, for a lot of us, I've done that mistake in my first company as well, um, where we try to abide by certain values, but you know, we didn't actually execute them ourselves. And we felt looking you know, other people should be doing this. It was, it was this whole um, holier than thou set, you know, kind of, uh, kind of mindset, which definitely doesn't work. Um, so I think it needs to be an extremely authentic set of um, principles that you are going to abide by and, 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 and work, work with. Um, I think it needs to be something that you yourself demonstrate as a, as a leader. Um, I think you need to um, have um, both the conversations around um, company, um, but you need to have the conversations about the individual. And this is, again, an area which a lot of uh, companies in scale-up mode sort of forget because we get so busy running that we just forget about that, you know, this is not just um, numbers on an Excel sheet, right? These are, these are mm. people with families and lives and, 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 and children. And, and, and so how do you make sure that um, you, you really get to know each other's sort of up, you know, requirements from us, yeah. from a family perspective, from a personal perspective, from a career perspective, um, and genuinely being curious, right? Um, I've found again, oftentimes that we, we do this performance review or some sort of a conversation saying, okay, you know what, you know, this is what you're doing. You need to do a little bit more of that. I, I, I have what we call uh, internally these getting to empty sessions okay. where I would be talking to, you know, another individual in the team or my leadership or uh, my partner um, about uh, there's no agenda, right? There's no agenda meetings. This is not about the business. It's not about anything. Literally what's bothering you, what's on your mind. Right. And I found if you can create that kind of non-threatening environment, you're able to get the best out of people, but also they sort of buy in so much to um, the human, right, on the other side, and not just their boss or their founder or their their their, their senior. So I think that is to me such an important part of this um, uh, 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 in in the right. authenticity around it. I think it's quite important, um, and you can't fake it. You you can you can try to fake it, but people will see through. It will actually not turn into a culture where you know everybody's sort of uh, giving a thousand percent and and believe it's their company. Right? The last thing we've done is we give uh, stocks to every single employee uh, that's sort of been 
that's sort of been my my approach uh, from the beginning. Uh, I know m- many companies don't do it. Yeah. Um, I believe that because technology companies grow this rapidly, because there is such a large disproportionate uh, financial outcome possible, um, even within a span of a few years, two, three, five years, um, that the, uh, and I'm going to use the word spoils, it's probably not the right word, but the yes. spoils yes. must be the shared. Yep. The rewards must be shared. There is no other way. I get sort of, I get so much satisfaction, so much fulfillment I've had in the last two, com- last two times where people that joined um, us on day one that took a lot of risk, um, you know, very high paying jobs they left in consulting and investment banking or sort of other professions um, to come and join us um, actually participate um, in a very good financial outcome as well. And I think uh, you can't just use words to do that. You can't just promise. You actually have to act, which is where if you're actually making them owners in the business, as stock op- uh, uh, as stock owners in the business, it genuinely creates a lot more buy-in um, as well, and not just through culture, not just through sort of individual um, support, but actually through um, through real uh, tangible uh, ways like like uh, like stocks. Fantastic, very good. And did you call those sessions getting to empty? Is that what is? Did I hear that yes. right? Yes, what, what, yes, is, yes. what is the getting to empty? What do, what do you mean by that? So getting to empty is um, it's it's there's there was a psychologist that um, that did a study on um, a, a thousand um, whatever plus uh, plus uh, companies um, between um, management teams relationships between management teams and they did the exact same study on uh, on couples um, that divorce or don't divorce um, or separate or don't separate right and. I think what they realize is to keep that team together and keep the relationship together, you need these very you know, non-agenda sort of talks uh, in a non-threatening, safe way where the, the person uh, is sharing their, 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 their you know, deepest sort of concerns, fears, frustrations um, without being judged uh, on the other side. Much, much harder I found with the, with the, with the at home uh, <laughs> yeah. than it is, so it's the, <laughs> than it is with... It does the empty yeah. come from emptying your baggage sort of thing, em- emptying yeah, everything. Exactly. That's, that's, okay, exactly. Good, good. exactly. Brilliant. No, I love it. That's really, really good. So um, just w- in in terms of how do you, because you, you've obviously, you know, you've looked after rapidly scaling companies, lots and lots of people coming coming in. How many direct reports do you have? Well, how do you, how do you look after that side? So this is the tough one, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> now my little one is here. I have a, I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old, and they're both very curious. Lovely. Um, as to as to um, as to uh, Kevin's podcast, and apologies for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's offering you the lollipop. Uh, oh, lovely. I didn't quite care. That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kiki. Can you give that to Mama? Can you give that to Mama and come back? Yeah. Thank you, monkey. Thank you so much. <laughs> Eat it. I will eat it. <laughs> you won't leave until I. <laughs> you I'll give it to Mama. Lollipop. Mama also wants it. Very good. You cannot debate with this two-year-old. She Very is good. impossible. Um, she is the boss of the house, as you know. Um, <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. So your question was um, your direct reports. So I think um, um, uh, in the first sort of uh, fifty people that get hired in the company. Um, which is actually roughly the stage we're at. Um, I make it a point to sort of uh, meet and interview pretty much everybody. Um, I believe um, the first 50, first 100 people sort of define the culture for the next 1,000 and the next 10,000, um, as I've seen in the last two times. So really making sure that there is um, a very good uh, alignment on values, on the overall vision where the company is trying to go is extremely important. Um, I like to strike this balance between um, direct reporting and sort of uh, delegation. And that's a very hard balance to strike. Early days, you're essentially, you are the individual contributor yourself. You're doing everything. I do I do customer calls. I do, you know, online sort of feedback on social media. I'll make ads. I'll sort of visit all the clients. I'll, I'll do everything myself. And I just think that's the only way to build when it's that early. And then you sort of figure out that, okay, I cannot do this anymore. I, I find that in the early days, you're sort of the actual individual contributor. You then move, which is like, let's say zero to 10 people, one to 10 people. Uh, Beyond that, you start to move into a phase where you have people that you can hand over topics to, 
because either you've done it well enough um, and understood it well enough that, you know, they should be able to run it or what, and the way I try to approach it is if hiring people sort of much better than yourself, right? Yeah. There'll be topics that, you know, I'm not, I'm not a finance person. I'm not a, uh, a technology. I can't, I can't actually code. I mean, I have a little bit, but I can't actually code. You need to hire people much better than yourself and sort of start to obsolete yourself from those topics. So that's sort of the 10 to 25 journey. Um, I think on the 25 to let's say 100 journey, what starts to happen and it's, it's changed a little bit based on remote working. Um, you start to see that um, you, you almost completely remove yourself entirely from topics where let's say my, my co-founder you know, runs operations and supply entirely. I'm literally not involved in supply at all. And that comes after a point where you've built enough trust, implicit trust with each other. Uh, you have what I call a shared brain space where you, know, you literally have talked so much about those topics that they can predict what you are going to think, you can predict mm-hmm. what they're going to think and sort of things just start to become organically working and operating by themselves. And I think that stage is quite critical. And a lot of founders get this wrong where you need to know which topics uh, to not touch anymore. Uh, And it's next to impossible because A, you will never be entirely out of um, uh, everything. It's just not possible. I remember this, uh, this, this beautiful example from Jeff Bezos where he, he sort of called the customer helpline himself in order to make a point with his team uh, in terms of uh, how the customer service was making people wait for 15 minutes. Uh, and Bill Gates sort of writing this email to this developer saying that, you know, that particular part of the code doesn't work. So you will always need to have, um, you, you need to be sort of, um, I don't want to sort of make this into a, uh, you know, so you, you, you need to have that big picture. You need to be able to have people that can take topics away from you, but you should be able to almost like a hawk dive in, swoop in, um, in granular topics when you see that it's not moving in the right direction. And that's, I think, the hardest bit to do, which is the the, the 10,000 feet, but also being able to swoop in. Yeah. Um, and that is, 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 is there's no, there's no, um, it's not that people can't learn that behavior. You can, you can spend time in fine tuning. And that's, I found that's the one big factor between companies scaling or not scaling is the ability for the founder to sort of, uh, stay at a at a macro or, or ten thousand feet level and being able to work the bigger topics, but also dive in uh, very quickly, not in a threatening way to the team, but almost in an inquisitive, curious way. Like yeah. why, why aren't we thinking about that? Uh, and so on. And that keeps the team also quite engaged, feel connected with the founder, and also in a way a little bit on the toes, if you will. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's a mindset that I found to be working quite well as you scale. Excellent. So just one little question on that, and I'm conscious we should let you get back to your daughters, but in, in how many people then do you have those getting to empty conversations with? Yes. Um, so, uh, great question. You you can't do this um, with 50 people in the team. Um, uh, so you do have to define what, um, and that group can grow, what that core group of the company is, and doesn't have to be the senior most people, to be honest. It can be. In many cases, it is as well. Uh, but what are the, you know, initially, and at this point, it might be, might be five or six people in the team um, yeah. that um, are that uh, um, mission critical, if you will, that are those that are so right. important for the topics that I'm not running myself, um, that I do believe those sessions are important. Um, so eventually, and to answer even your previous question, I think five to six reports is a very healthy number. Um, uh, you do start with the first few months you do start with like 10 um right and it goes beyond as well but uh, uh, research dictates that beyond seven you start to become very ineffective as a as a leader so yeah uh, i think I've, I've tried to keep it below that number perfect brilliant well abby i've, I've um learned a lot from you today really enjoyed our conversation thank you very much indeed for for coming on scout radio today um if people would like to get hold of you or find out more about turn what's the best way for them to do that of course i mean add me on linkedin um my spelling is a v i n a v uh nigam and i'm you know i'm sure it'll probably get posted as well um you can you can email me um uh, it's my first name avinav at turn t-e-r-n hyphen group dot com uh, so very happy to sort of receive, um, always keep excited to meet people that are curious and looking to, um, uh, sort of, uh, participate in, um, in a discussion about, um, how to build companies. It's my, it's my, uh, it's my lifelong passion. So, uh, very, very keen to, to connect with any, any people that do want to reach out.
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today, Ali, and I wish you all the best with Turn and, and, and with your daughters. We should let you get back to your daughters now. So thank you. For Thanks, Kevin. It was a pleasure. Ready. Really, really great. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. And if you're building and scaling your own business, you might well be interested in our book, The Entrepreneurial Scale-Up System. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. It's a practical handbook around scaling a business in a structured way. And you can order a copy on all your favorite online retailers, including an audio version, or you can find it and other supporting resources on our website, www.esusgroup.co.uk. That's esusgroup.co.uk, which is E-S-U-S-G-R-O-U-P.co.uk. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast. 